all right so now let's move to a 3d example okay now the 3d example uh, as it turns out will actually be easier to the math will be easier so let's see what it is like okay so the wave equation remains exactly the same the only thing to note now is that it's 3d so of these 1 2 and 3 terms which terms will be different from before let's go first term will the first term be different well it will be different because uh, if i choose a coordinate system now what coordinate system should i choose for a 3d uh, problem 3d spherical coordinates that's the most natural because if i put my uh, like if i do the same choice that i did before put the point source the impulse at the origin then there is perfect spherical symmetry for the problem right so then the rather than cylindrical coordinates spherical coordinates is going to be the most intuitive uh, coordinate system so del squared will change right earlier it was for polar 2d now for 3d spherical right so um, yeah I, I don't expect you to remember the form of del squared so del squares has a lot of terms for theta dependence and phi dependence we'll just keep the r dependent terms and uh, that's uh, 1 by r square and uh, tau by tau r r squared tau by tau r so this we just look up and use it okay that's the operator Uh, the second term remains as is what about the third term third term we just have to take care to know uh, to keep in mind that it's a 3d delta function okay earlier it was a 2d delta function and even before that it was a 1d delta function okay so that's just one thing that we have to keep in mind and we'll just sort of repeat the recipe that we had previously we will choose r greater than r naught such that what happens is that i get a del squared g plus k squared g is equal to 0 okay so first I will solve this and then uh, look at uh, boundary conditions okay so um, when I go to uh, sort of uh, solve this uh, let us let us put this in over here right so these partial derivatives go away they become total derivatives because there is no theta phi dependence I have put the my uh, impulse at the origin right uh, so let us see so what I can do is so this is 1 by r squared okay d by dr r squared dg by dr plus k squared g is equal to 0 okay uh, one small trick I will do is I will just multiply r everywhere okay Now I can uh, the only thing that I can ex, uh, sort of simplify in this is the first term right there is a derivative of something so I can open up this so two functions product of two functions and derivative right so the first uh, term will be so I can take the derivative of r square right so I will get 2 r uh, dg by dr and that r will get cancelled off so I will get a 2 dg by dr that is the first term then r r yes r into d 2 g by d r 2 and the second term remains as is k squared r g is equal to 0 uh, all right now any ideas on how to further simplify this so the hint is this that the we are looking at sec there are second order derivatives that is the maximum order of derivative you see a two term over here so when you see a two term and a second derivative what kind of a trick could you play could you write this whole expression as the second order derivative of something of some function I want to try to write it like this d2 by dr2 something plus k squared rg is equal to 0 what might what might that something be mm, actually I made one mistake here this should be r yeah that 1 r got cancelled off yeah definitely a g has to be there 2 r square g 2 r square g no r some square g. what about simply r g 
So, this will have g second derivative of g multiplied by r plus 2 times first derivative of each term plus g times second derivative of r which is which is 0 second derivative of r is 0 right. So, you can just expand this over here do you want me to do it ok fine yeah. So, this manipulation has given me a equation that looks actually very familiar what does this look like yeah even simpler than Helmholtz equation it is a simple harmonic oscillator model right I have second derivative of some function plus k squared this thing. So, r g is equal to sin k kind of a or cos k that kind of a thing works the most general way of writing a oscillatory function is instead of sin cos what can I generalize that to Expo e to the j right. So, I can write down in the final form over here this r g of r therefore, should be equal to it is a second order differential equation. So, how many solutions are possible independent solutions two what are those two. So, I want to write down now this right. So, the first function will be so e to the j is what we agreed ok. So, let us make it more precise e to the what should I write j k r if I take second derivative of this function what will I get I will get a minus j k and then I will get a minus k square right and a constant that is unknown is that all is that the only possible solution minus, minus, minus right that is the second independent solution that will be a minus j k r right. So, I can uh, just write this take the r over here and I have a a So, these kinds of functions are what are they called they are spherical plane waves unlike uh, 1 d plane waves the amplitude of these functions it decays as you go away from at larger and larger r which is physically what you expect if I place a impulse at the origin if I go away amplitude should decay right. So, again now we know we know what tricks to play now right we can ask of these two terms can I eliminate at least one term by boundary conditions right. So, the trick is the time convention. So, our time convention as before is e to the plus j omega t. So, which term can I get rid of a term, a term right because a term will correspond to a incoming wave. Right? So, a is equal to 0 and so the final form that I have is g of r is equal to b e to the minus j k r by r ok. okay. Now, what what remains is the constant b ok by now you know the game. So, we take this uh, differential equation and do a volume integral on both sides ok even though I am putting one integral sign I do mean a three dimensional integration. So, what happens let us look at the first term ok this is the first term I can play the same trick that I had played previously right. So, I should try to write this as the divergence of something right. So, I can write uh, del squared g as divergence of grad g right and then I have a over volume d v right. So, this will become what outward flux of grad g right. So, this will become grad g dot n hat d s and what is my uh, sort of problem setup this is my x y z and I have a, a sphere right v epsilon right it is a sphere radius epsilon ok. What is the outward normal r. which is equal to r hat because it is centered at the origin right. So, n hat is equal to r hat ok. Uh, grad g again this is only a 
r dependent problem so this is only go this is only going to give me del g by del r r hat okay uh, so <coughs> what do i get from the first term over here i get so my constant b will be there over the surface uh, grad g right so what was my g i will just write it over here b e to the minus j k r by r okay so i have to take the derivative of this guy with respect to r so uh, first term will be let's say minus j k e to the minus j k r by r okay second term will be derivative of 1 by r which is minus 1 by r squared <coughs> okay what will ds be what is ds surface r no we are you are not r dr d theta that's 2d in 3d r squared sin theta d theta d phi that's the surface uh, differential element i mean on the surface of the sphere that's the differential uh, surface element it's easy here because uh, there is no theta phi dependence so this integral over here is going to give me 4 pi 4 pi is what i am going to get out of it right everything else inside the integrand is constant as a function of d theta d phi right so it's all going to just uh, pop out over here so what will it pop out to so there will be there's a minus sign on both both these terms have a minus sign so i can take that out so i'll put a minus i'll get a 4 pi from the integral so i'll get a minus 4 pi b right and uh, these two terms over here so i'm going to get a j k uh, e to the minus j k r by r plus e to the j k r by r squared zero sorry not zero evaluated at r is equal to epsilon right uh there was a r square also right yeah there's an r square also which of these terms will survive as i put uh if i take epsilon tending to 0 which of these terms will survive only the second term because r square r square cancels off as r equals to epsilon and epsilon tends to 0 what happens the first term goes to 0 second term survives and what do i get minus 4 pi b okay uh very good so that was the first term what about the second term second term we will have to do this integral right so it's going to be k squared and this is a volume integral b e to the minus j k r by r sorry just by r and r squared four pi d r right i have i have eliminated the theta and phi integral because there is no theta phi dependent that will give me the four pi so i'm left with this and integration is from 0 to epsilon okay is that clear so i can take out all of these constants 4 pi k squared b 0 to epsilon r e to the minus j k r dr so that's all that survives okay so um you can work this out okay this is a very simple integration to do uh like before Uh, I'm not going to actually do it. It's it's a very simple integral for you to do. Uh, what do you intuitively expect this answer to be? Zero, right? How can you see this intuitively without actually doing the integration? Hmm. Symmetry is not going to help you here. Any other argument? Hmm. Yeah, the mod of the integrand is. yeah okay another way of seeing it is that the integrand is something which is is it always finite is always finite 
and I'm integrating over a volume. So I'm going to get some finite quantity multiplied by the volume at best, right? And that volume is shrinking to zero. Now, if there was a delta function in here, then I have to pay a little bit more attention. Like if it were a log or something, then I have to pay a little bit more attention. But here the integrand is finite, integrating over a finite volume, which I will, which I will set to zero. So these kinds of tricks you should use and just say that as uh, epsilon tends to zero, this is equal to zero. Okay, And you can manually verify by doing this integration. Uh, right, And the third term is going to give us so 3D delta function integrated over that volume, I should get minus 1. Okay, So the final expression that I will get is uh, minus 4 pi b is equal to minus 1 and b is equal to 1 by 4 pi. So g of r is equal to 1 by 4 pi r e to the minus j k r, that is it. So once again, we will. This was when I placed the uh, impulse at the origin. But if I want to write it in general, what do I do? I will ask what is g of r r prime. So now I should write it in a little bit more careful way. So I'll have a one by four pi e to the minus j k r minus r prime divided by mod of r minus r prime because I am interested only in the distance r uh, between the two. So in many books you will find that instead of writing it, this is slightly cumbersome to write. So many people use the shortcut that r, capital R is defined to be r minus r prime. So you will find e to the minus jk capital R by capital R many places. Okay, This is the final expression. Okay, so you, you saw we started with the 1D case of the string, which was which gave us a nice continuous function, very easy to handle. 2D case gave us a little bit more difficulty because of the integration had a the Green's function had a log term. So integrating it, we had to do it carefully, uh, and we came across a wave kind of function which we had previously not seen before with the Hankel function or the Bessel function. When we come to 3D, it's, it got even simpler. There was nothing fancy in the integration, right? And I got this uh, spherical 3D wave. Okay. So if someone asks you what is the plane wave in 3D, don't write e to the minus j k r minus omega t. That's technically not right because it just goes off to infinity. Right? A 3D plane wave is usually referred to as a, a spherical plane wave. A 2D plane wave is a Hankel function. 1D plane wave is what we have always studied, e to the minus j k x minus omega t. Okay. Um, all right. So what we have done is we started with some kind of basic motivation and went on to 1D, 2D, and 3D. Um, chapter 14 of Balanus's book gives a very nice uh, introduction to Green's function in all three dimensions. So that can you can take that as the reading material. Okay. Why is there a okay? So yeah. So okay, why okay? We can just spend some more time on this. Okay. So the question is that uh, when we looked at one D, two D, three D, why is there a different form appearing each time? And uh, mathematically, you know the reason. The reason is each time. This guy over here. The del squared guy is what is changing its form. Earlier, supposing I had a 1D plane wave, then it was just second derivative with respect to x. Now I have this 1 by r, 1 by r square, all of these different terms are coming. So that's changing the um, changing the mathematical form of the equation itself. Right? And that's what's changing the final result. Okay. And uh, as far as a physical intuition, if you want for it, then it's it's the way in which energy has to be distributed in multiple dimensions. I mean, it depends on how many dimensions there are. So it is a wave, it decays off to zero as you go away from it, it is oscillatory, but how to manage this energy distribution in various dimensions gives rise to slightly different functions. Okay. Even in the case of the 2D, so look at the behavior far away. right? So far away from uh, the origin, you can see, I mean, the it is there is a 1 by r dependence over here, 
okay in the 2d case what was the dependence if you go let's go back over here all the way right as i went far away from the origin these are the far field expressions how what is the dependence like one by root r right so you can see that uh, this whether it's r or root r and then when you go to 1d case what is it there is no such term in the denominator right so in some sense there's uh, if I look at 2D and 3D, because they are truly the physical uh, waves, uh, it's in my opinion the way energy has to be balanced in uh, multiple dimensions, 2 versus 3. That's what is giving us this different form. In 1D, yeah, 1D is a strange case. I mean, it's uh, quite unphysical. The wave just goes on forever. Uh, it's very difficult for you to actually think of a physical 1D problem. What does that mean? There's always a second dimension involved somehow. But this, these graphs really, they convey the intuition of it. If you plot the 3D Green's function, it will look similar to this, right? It will have the maxima, uh, I mean, it will have some large value at the origin and then begin to decay off. So physically, that's what we expect. Okay, I think what we'll do is, uh, we'll call it a quit over here, instead of starting the next module on method of movements. Okay, so we'll stop here.